Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Joey Only from Vancouver. When I'm in Victoria, I listen to all good news all the time on Gorilla Radio, airing on CFUV 101.9 FM in Victoria. Welcome to Gorilla Radio on CFUV 101.9 FM in Victoria, cfuv.uvic.ca on the internet everywhere else. Well, if there's anything good to say about America's foreign policy focus in the Middle East in recent years, it is the relative absence of its meddling presence in Latin America. Though still referred to in Washington as its backyard, countries like Venezuela, Bolivia, and Nicaragua have had a chance to flourish in the absence of their northern gardeners whose groundskeeping in the 1980s is still remembered there, if not here, as a dark age of death squad terrors and hopelessness. Nowhere, perhaps, was that more true than in the tiny Central American nation of El Salvador, where the infamous killing of Archbishop Oscar Romero and brutal murder of four nuns focused the world's appalled attention. Yes, it's been a halcyon period this last decade or so without Teal Gringo around, but as the coup in Honduras and repeated attempts to overthrow the Bolivarians in Venezuela instruct, America's attention is never far from turning back to its backyard. Jay Hartling is an independent journalist, broadcaster, and community development volunteer with the UN Development Program and International Labor Organization, where she advises on indigenous rights and natural resource conflicts. She's a graduate of SFU's Latin America Studies program and has a master's degree in public policy garnered right here at UVic. Jay is currently working in El Salvador with Vice President, uh, with rather the Vice President's Commission on Social Justice, but will be here in Victoria this week for an event hosted by the Central America Support Committee, or CASC, to kick off the first of this season's CAFE Sympatico meetings. She'll be speaking on change in Latin America. Jay Hartling in the first half. And it's been a dozen years since America unleashed its fury upon the impoverished nation of Afghanistan. In that time, uncounted thousands have perished, been mangled, orphaned, and rendered homeless. More than 150 Canadians have died too fighting there, with many more than uh, than we know about being wounded. But one Canadian casualty case is unique. Omar Qadar was a boy of 15 when U.S. Special Forces descended on the mountain compound where he happened to be living. They came after a barrage, guns blazing, killing everyone, everything that moved. Heather Marsh is a journalist, human rights activist, and author of the book Binding Chaos, an examination of mass collaboration. She served as editor-in-chief of WL Central when that WikiLeaks site first released the Guantanamo Files and is currently the national spokesperson for the Free Omar Khadr Group in Canada, spending her time writing, speaking, and advocating for Omar's release. Heather Marsh and the ongoing case of Omar Khadr in an injustice festering yet at the heart of Canadian justice in the second half. And Victoria Street News publisher and CFUV radio broadcaster Janine Bancroft will join us at the bottom of the hour to bring us up to speed with some of what's good to do in and around the city. But first, Jay Hartling and cha- uh, change is good and well, not so much so in Latin America. Stick around. Well, welcome to the program, Jay. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. Well, it's my pleasure, of course. Now, you had me scared for a minute. I thought you'd fallen asleep during the introduction. <laughs> That was a joke, Jay. Okay, well, listen, Jay, now national elections are underway in El Salvador, or they're just coming up, at least. Uh, And it wasn't too long ago, uh, Jay, that international observers like uh, our own recently returned Kevin Nish risked life and limb to to ensure some semblance of democracy at those polls. Now, what's the atmosphere down there right now uh, surrounding the election? Hello? Oh, can you not hear me, Jay? Oh, God. Jay, can you hear me? Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Uh, all right, so what I'm going to do then is uh, I'm going to uh, <laughs> fart and tap dance a little bit here, find something to play, and then I'm going to try to reconnect with Jay. Jay, you, st- you still can't hear me? No. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'll carry on, and, uh, and you know, Larry's got terrific taste in music, and, and fortunately he left, uh, he left his CD in, uh, in the machine, so I'm going to play a little bit of what he was playing, and then I'll try to reconnect. Now I think we've ironed out our bugs. Jay, please tell me you can hear me. I can hear you. Sweet. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. Now, Jay, what I was going to start with was I was going to ask you, you know, what, what's the, you know, as I preface the the uh, El Salvador, the elections are coming up. So what um, what's the what's the mood right now down there? Well, uh, the elections are coming up on February fourth of twenty fourteen. The official launch is next week. So. The atmosphere has been fairly tense. It's a really important election because in 2009, the FMLN, which uh, represents the Progressive Left, 
uh, one for the first time in 150 years. So it was the first time that we've seen a left government uh, govern. And uh, in order to continue the process of change, it's really important that they win these elections in the first round. So the, um, the atmosphere is fairly tense. Um, probably the most interesting thing really is what's happened um, with the right wing in El Salvador, which has been a, a complete split down the middle since 2009 between uh, those that control different economic interests in the country. And so the, uh, the competition between them is, is fairly brutal. Um, you know, uh, those of us on the left like to see that because that means that they are fighting amongst themselves. Uh, but the, uh, there's a possibility that the new third party could be a spoiler in the election. Well, now, how, how is this compared to, say, neighbor Honduras, where we saw the coup in 2009, endorsed uh, first uh, and most uh, vociferously by our own prime minister here in Canada, Stephen Harper, and then sort of given the, eventually uh, um, given the stamp of approval by the Obama administration, it, does the the rise of the right in uh, El Salvador, does is this uh, something that's running in parallel with what's going on in Honduras? Well, I think they're desperately trying to cling to power in El Salvador as they are in Honduras and elsewhere. In Latin America, as we see uh, progressive uh, change over the last 10 to 15 years. So the right in El Salvador have been um, considerably weakened since uh, the FMLN won in 2009. And, uh, and that's because um, they have lost most of their economic privileges. They use the government as their own personal banking system. So uh, the coffers of government were emptied out uh, by the right wing uh, during successive uh, governments. And so what they find is that you know, they're in a position where they can no longer control that. Uh, and so they're desperate to cling to power and to come back in in 2014. And and what about the FLMN? How have they done? I mean, what's the economic situation in the country right now? Has it, has it improved markedly since uh, the rise of the left? Uh, I would say, you know, four years is not a long time, right? So um, they've done some, some very interesting things over the last four years in the area of social programs in particular, uh, around health care, around education, uh, making those both um, you know, nearly universally uh, accessible, um, and a number of other excellent programs. So, you know, they've increased access to health care uh, dramatically in the country over the last four years, so the people in remote areas now have access. The same as education. On the, the subject of the economy, uh, you have to remember that, you know, the successive governments had pretty much drained the government coffers dry, so when the FMLN took power in 2009, uh, there wasn't too much left. And, mm -hmm. in fact, in, in some cases, like in the water, uh, the water company, the state water company, I think there was something like $10 in the bank account or something. So they did have to start from, uh, you know, zero and try to build up uh, a different type of model. And I think the challenge has been that the FMLN is really a coalition government right now. It's not purely FMLN. So if um, what the hope is in 2014, if they can uh, win in the first round and bring in a much stronger FMLN government um, with an actual uh, party um, leader like Sanchez Seren at the head, then they'll be able to um, go further with the economy, with security, and other issues that are also important to people. Well, well, now, Jay, you know, as I mentioned in the introduction, you, you're just across the water from us right now over there on the peninsula in, in uh, Port Townsend, but you're going to be here in Victoria um, coming up on, uh, what is it here, uh, on the September 27th, which is, uh, what day is that, Thursday? Friday night. Friday, Friday night, of course, Friday, Cafe Simpatico. And uh, at 7 p.m. down at 1923 Fernwood Road, right in the heart of uh, uh, Fernwood. So do you want to give us a, a little bit of a heads up on... on uh, what your uh, presentation is going to be about? Well, I am going to talk about the, the El Salvador uh, situation, what's happening, because I know a lot of people are, are really interested, particularly because the Central American uh, Solidarity Committee um, has done a lot of work in, in Central America. So I will talk a little bit about that, but I'm, I'm also going to talk about natural resource conflict uh, as a product of change. Um, we all assume that you know nat natural resource extraction is done by uh, multinational corporations in you know in, in countries where uh, 
where that's important, like in Chile and Peru, et cetera. But also Bolivia is highly extractive, and so is Venezuela. Um, and so I want to talk about how they're dealing with conflict over natural resources um, uh, currently around mining, around uh, oil and gas exploration, big infrastructure projects, stuff like that. So they're really interesting to people, uh, you know, since Canada is uh, such a natural resource-dependent economy, um, to hear how left governments are, are trying to, to uh, address that. That problem. Well, and of course, Canada is uh, is a big player in Central America, South America, Asia, Africa, uh, mining interests that fly at least uh, the Canadian flag are down there. Uh, what's the situation in El Salvador? Are there Canadian interests down there, and, and what are they up to, if so? Yeah, well, you're right. I mean, Canada is probably the biggest, uh, certainly in junior exploration around mining in the in, uh, in Latin America. In Peru, the number one country that's investing right now in mining is Canada. In El Salvador, um, you probably are familiar with the Pacific Rim case, um, but uh, El Salvador has an unofficial moratorium right now on metal mining as they consider the future. Um, the FMLN candidate has said that he will ban metal mining uh, should he win. Um, the others have remained silent, but in the meantime, there hasn't been any mineral exploration. Other than that, it's already ongoing. So what, what they did was they stopped any new permits. So the Canadian company, Pacific Rim, has taken them to an international trade court, mm -hmm. has taken the government to an international trade court to try to sue the Salvadorian government for their lost opportunity due to the fact that they weren't given a permit. Uh, fairly, that's a fairly well-known case. There's been, uh, you know, complaints of violence and, uh, uh, you know, there's been uh, disappearances in the community around the mine. So it's fairly well-known, that issue. And, and those stories are, you know, not every mine has this story, but certainly Guatemala, Honduras, Colombia, Peru, um, Chile as well. Uh, you've seen a lot of resource conflict involved in Canadian companies. So um, it would be interesting to talk about how that's being dealt with on Friday night. Well, and also I mentioned during uh, during the 1980s, the horrible uh, uh, dark period there with the death squads and uh, the thousands of people that were killed and disappeared. Are these are, are the people that are profiting by these extractive industries now and the people that they're using to provide their security, I'll call it, are, are there clear connections to the former death squad uh, right-wing government there? Well, I wouldn't say there's any clear connection, right? There never is. So, but definitely there are suspected connections between uh, companies that, um, I, I would say, provide security in the area, but also probably the main financiers of, the, of those operations um, that have connections to former members of death squads who are, you know, still alive and they're still, um, still operating, uh, not to the extent that they were during the Civil War, of course, right? But... Uh, yeah, El Salvador, behind Honduras, is the second most violent country in the world. So um, uh, some of that is perpetrated, obviously, by uh, organized crime, which is connected to the economic interests in the country, and those are mostly the, the old money, the, the oligarchy. But not so much so like in, say, Guatemala, where, where the leadership is still made up of members that were, you know, high-ranking high generals at the time of, the, of their uh, death squads and, and uh, genocide. Yeah, correct. Guatemala is quite a different case. I mean, uh, it's essentially a narco state uh, being driven by um, drug trafficking interests. Uh, and so um, El Salvador is somewhat different, and I'd say a lot more peaceful in the sense that, uh, you know, their electoral process has really gone through um, a quite a bit of change. There's been a new electoral act. Um, you mentioned before that um, there are Canadian observers that go down. There's observers from all over the world. And those things are important, right, to make sure that people get to exercise their rights in peace. But more importantly, the people they're electing are actually people who uh, represent uh, the people more clearly than, say, in Guatemala or, as a case, with uh, the fake elections in Honduras. So, um, you know, they, they're trying to clean up government in El Salvador. It's a long, slow process. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen in four years. But I'd say the trust in the politicians and particularly some of the better ministers in, in, in the Salvadorian cabinet that have done some amazing work. The health minister, a 90-year-old woman, right, has, has completely overhauled the healthcare system in El Salvador. The minister of public works has done amazing things. 
finally brought uh, um, the former Minister of Transportation, who uh, basically siphoned off uh, $20 million for some infrastructure projects, finally brought him to court. So you're seeing a bit of a clean-up in government. Um, nothing's perfect, of course, but uh, much different than Guatemala in terms of what their interests are. Well, if you've just tuned in, you're listening to Grill Radio on CFUV 101.9 in Victoria, CFUV.uvic.ca on the internet everywhere else. I'm speaking tonight with Jay Hartling. Jay is a, an independent journalist, broadcaster, community development volunteer with the UN Development Program and works with the International Labor Organization where she advises on indigenous rights and natural resource conflicts. Uh, Jay, you're currently down, you're currently living, well, not this moment, but you're currently living in El Salvador, right? That's correct, yeah. Well, now, so Jay, what, you know, what's that? Tell me what that's like going down there. I mean, you speak the language, obviously. Yes, <laughs> thankfully, I'm uh, fluently bilingual, but uh, it's it's quite different, you know. I mean, I I love El Salvador. I love Latin America generally. I've traveled all over. Um, El Salvador is a wonderful country. It's a small, you know, really tiny country with um, uh, you know a lot of diversity um, within its sort of ecological boundaries. Um, I'd say, you know, the biggest, toughest issue for me is security, personal security. And as a woman, I would say I deal with a fair bit of machismo in El Salvador uh, and in other countries as well around the region. But um, I'd say my personal security and my personal liberty as a, as a female, um, having come from Canada where, you know, we're just so used to going out and walking around, and I wouldn't think anything of walking somewhere at midnight, um, you know, that's been severely curtailed. So you just learn to adjust your behaviors and your living patterns around those things, but the country is so interesting. I've learned so much uh, around so many different topics. It's endless, you know, so um, I really, really enjoyed it. I've learned a lot about myself, about, you know, who I am as a person, but also, you know, uh, as a Canadian living abroad, you know, my responsibilities and, and what they are when I when I live in Canada as well. It's been a very interesting experience. Well, that you know, that reminds me of a conversation I had with the Canadian filmmaker Jesse Freeston, who traveled to Cuba with a, a, a friend of his from El Salvador, which is where Jesse had done a lot of work, and uh, they were traveling around one night in in, in uh, Havana, and um, his he looked and his El Salvadorian friend was weeping because he had seen there was children in the middle of you know out late at night, children playing in the streets. And it made it made him so emotional because he had, he said he'd never seen a child out uh, at night in El Salvador before. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's it's definitely changing, um, but uh, it, you know, the people are very very aware of the personal security, and uh, you know, uh, El Salvador has a long-standing gang issue, um, as well as you know other other issues that are more related to. Uh, regional Central American issues of the infiltration of, of organized crime. So, um, you know, su- personal security is definitely um, an issue. And so when people, yeah, when Salvadorians come to visit me in Canada, um, they're often, you know, really, really uh, thrilled by the fact that we can just walk around at all hours and not really tend to worry about uh, what, what would happen to you. Well, well, now, Jay, as, as I mentioned, Jay's, Jay's going to be uh, here in Victoria this Friday at the first Cafe Simpatico of the season, September 27th. The doors open there at 7 p.m. with some live music and uh, at seven uh, at 7.30. And the program starts at 8. Uh, that's at 1923 Fernwood Road. And uh, and uh, and again, she'll be speaking about uh, El Salvador, the cha- or, or about South America, or <laughs> Central Latin America, changes in Latin America. Well, you know, I'm sorry, Jay, with a screw-up with the phones, but it, it's curtailed our time, but do you want to leave us with a, with a teaser for your, your talk? Sure. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk uh, a little bit about what's been happening in Bolivia. I think it's very interesting to people who may not have uh, a lot of connection um, with, with what's happening there under uh, the government of Evo Morales. And I'm going to talk about uh, in the indigenous movements there and how um, they uh, both work with and work against. Uh, the government, and what is the role of um, international NGOs, international aid money, and foreign governments um, in uh, the usage of indigenous rights to topple the Morales government. So uh, I have an interesting case about a highway that people might like to hear about, but also mention some other things that are happening in in Peru, in Chile, in Panama, Costa Rica, more generally, around... um, 
around uh, indigenous rights and uh, and resource extraction. So it should be interesting. It's a very topical and very current. I understand Canada and BC, in fact, is going through uh, similar types of issues mm-hmm. in northern British Columbia right now with the pipeline. So it should be interesting. Here. Well, yeah, and and and, that, and I guess that was my last thing. Is there an awareness down there of the Idle No More movement? Well, yes, <laughs> and that's you know, it's it's uh, you, you think maybe not, right? Because people don't really pay attention to Canada. But yes, it did make the, the international news. I remember I was giving a presentation somewhere when that was happening, and I was talking about Indigenous rights, and someone stood up and said, you know, well, in Canada, you know that. Uh, indigenous people have taken to the streets, and so they are very aware. I mean, we live in a totally different world than we did, you know, 20 years ago, where uh, people have access to all kinds of information. So they're very well connected. There's all kinds of international indigenous networks that link, link people up as well. And I, um, I actually uh, organized an exchange for um, some Bolivian indigenous people. They are uh, Guarani from the flatlands, from the lowlands, uh, to come to. Alberta to work with the First Nation in Alberta around uh, duty to consult issues so they could learn about how they work with the government or, you know, uh, in terms of consultation and big natural resource projects so they can um, create their own capacity. Well, it sounds fascinating, Jay, and, I, and, and again, it's this Friday, 7 p.m. I, I recommend you get there early because uh, the Cafe Simpatico, it, it, it's not that big, you know, so you, you want to get in there. It's 1923 Fernwood Road, right in the heart of the village there. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Jay Hartling, for coming on tonight, and we look forward to seeing you here in Victoria Friday. Great. Thanks, Chris. And, yeah, uh, uh, what's great about community radio is its unpredictability, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> the fault is always with you. But uh, well, thanks I, for having me on, well, and I hope to meet you on Friday. Well, and I know you're a pro. You were in Vancouver with community radio for a long, long time, and uh, we didn't get a chance to get to that, but next time. Thanks a lot, Jay. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, okay, good night. Now, I'm going to take a brief break. When I come back, I'm going to be joined, <laughs> fingers crossed, by uh, by Janine, and she's going to bring us up to speed with some of the local good things going on and, and things further afield as well. So stick around for that. Hey, uh, welcome back to Grill Radio, CFUV 101.9 FM, cfuv.uvic.ca, if you want to listen to us uh, stream live on the Internet. Joining me now, as off time she does, is Victoria Street News publisher and CFUV radio broadcaster in her own right, Janine Bancroft. Hey, Janine. Hey, Chris. I guess you saw that there were 70,000 people in the streets in Vancouver yesterday for Truth and Reconciliation. Yeah, well, I saw an aerial photograph of it. It, that, that was I couldn't believe it, actually. 70,000 people in Vancouver. Man, that's something else. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty cool. You know, I've been listening to co-op radio in the mornings, in the media mornings from 7 to 8. And uh, they've been talking to some people about, you know, because the, they've been having the Truth and Reconciliation Conference in Vancouver. And I think it's important to, to consider the, that, um, you know, some of the points they made. One is that colonization is still happening. So, you know, we can, it's important to have this Truth and Reconciliation and hear these horrible stories of the what happened inside the residential schools. The last one was closed down in 1995, I believe it was. So, that, you know, this is recent history. But also to recognize this isn't something that happened in the past, that this colonization is still going on, like what you talked about with, with Jane about, uh, you know, what's going on in the north with the theft of land. Another interesting thing is that the um, Truth and Reconciliation event was sponsored by Kinder Morgan, which, you know, they want to build a, a, build a bigger pipeline um, to Vancouver from the tar sands and ship currently 70,000 barrels a day. They want to move it up to 660,000 barrels per day. Um, there are currently 80 tankers cruising by Victoria, Oak Bay, uh, 80 tankers every year, and each one carrying three times the amount of oil that was spilled by the Exxon Valdez. They want to increase that to 420 a year. So these are people who sponsored this Truth and Reconciliation. I don't think they sponsored the walk that you saw was of 70,000 people, but... You know, what's going on here? And the other one is TransCanada. And these are the folks who want to build the Keystone XL pipeline from Alberta to the Gulf Coast. They got a mention on the official uh, TRC uh, website. So just, you know, something to, to consider that um, there's other stuff going on, right? That, that the corporations, they're, they're slimy and they try to get in any way they can. 
Well, yeah, that's... And I know we don't have a lot of time, but I do want to mention, Chris, that Tarek and John, I guess you heard about them, these uh, uh, emergency physician and a filmmaker and professor, two Canadians who mm -hmm. uh, were arrested by Egyptian authorities on their way to Gaza. You heard about them, right? Well, well, yeah, actually, I've been following it when it happened, you know, they, and I know the story, and, and I mentioned it a few weeks ago on the air because I have a contact in Cairo, and I asked him to ask around, you know, just like this was a couple of days after they'd been arrested. And, you know, he, he said that they, you know, th that they were being held. And, and the reason they were, it, they were being so slow about it was because they were bound for Gaza. And, and the current government of right. Egypt, this military uh, coup government, really, really, really doesn't like Hamas, the, the uh, government of uh, Gaza. And so anything to do with Hamas, you know, you're going to have a really hard time with this. I, I didn't expect, and, and my friend in Cairo didn't expect either, that they would be held this long. You know, they thought, oh, they would process 30, them. Yeah, thir 38 days, pardon me, yeah, 38 days. This is a, an emergency physician and a filmmaker, and they were going to Gaza to, to do some filming about what's going on in one of the hospitals. So today's day 38, they, lo they started a hunger strike eight days ago. So definitely something to keep an eye on. The website is Tarek and, and John com, and then I know you uh, are out of time. But in the mm. good news portion of your All Good News All the Time show, I would just want to acknowledge that the Union of BC Municipalities at their AGM in Vancouver last week passed a resolution that they will ask as an organization, the UBCM, or, uh, will ask the BC government to legislate the prohibition of importing, exporting, and growing plants and seeds containing genetically engineered uh, DNA and raising GE animals within BC. So to declare BC a GE-free area. Now, of course, whether the BC government goes along with that is a whole other issue. And just one event, uh, if I have time, is um, sure. on Tuesday night. This is to do with the climate emergency, uh, perspectives on fighting global warming. It's a free public forum. Uh, there's uh, organizations, local organizations that are bringing a fellow named Fred Magdoff to town, and he is a co-author of a book called What Every Environmentalist Needs to Know About Capitalism. He's a professor emeritus in plant and soil si science at the University of Vermont, and this event is Tuesday at 7 p.m. at UVic in the Hickman Building, Room 105. Well, wow. and, and of course, Janine, your program, uh, uh, Winds of Change, alternating Thursdays at 11 a.m. right here with Mehdi Najari's Hidden News. And uh, you're on this week, I understand, or, or are you? You're doing a tape the tape thing or something? I am not, but um, oh. Jen, ha Jen Harmer, she's the new women's uh, collective coordinator, and she's going to be hosting the show. Oh, I see. And do you know what uh, Jen's going to be featuring? I don't. No, I will be surprised <laughs> as well. So yeah, I'm I'm happy to to share the space. I'm I'm uh, currently looking after some uh, a lovely doggy and a kitty cat uh, on a little island. So oh, well, that sounds. I can't get there, but um, yeah. And the street news is out. And thanks everybody for supporting that too. Okay, well, Janine, thanks a lot for coming on again, and uh, we'll talk to you the next time then, eh? Okay, thank you, Chris. All right, until the next time. Well, um, you know, it's been a dozen years since uh, America unleashed its fury upon the impoverished nation of Afghanistan. In that time, uncounted thousands have perished, been mangled, orphaned, rendered homeless. More than 150 Canadians have died, too, fighting there, with many more than we know being wounded. But one Canadian casualty case is unique. Omar Khadr was a boy of 15 when U.S. Special Forces descended on the mountain cap uh, compound where he was living. They came after a barrage, guns blazing, killing everyone, everything that moved. Now, when the dust settled, Omar was found grievously wounded and begging to be put out of his misery. Well, it was those pleas made in perfect Canadian English that spared his life. But his life since has been a Kafkaesque nightmare of torture and imprisonment in two of the world's most notorious prisons, and his ordeal persists still more than 11 years later. Heather, Heather Marsh is a journalist, human rights activist, and author of the book Binding Chaos, an examination of mass collaboration. She served as editor-in-chief of WL Central when that WikiLeaks, uh, WikiLeaks rather, site first released the Guantanamo Files and is currently the national spokesperson for the Free Omar Khadr Group in Canada, spending her time writing, speaking, and advocating for Omar's release. Welcome to the program, Heather. Hi, how are you, Chris? Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Uh, of course, I, I've overwritten my speaking ability, but I'll try to carry on. Now, now Heather, wh what's the status? What's Omar's status right now? The judge is um, 
he says his, he knows what the verdict is and he will announce it later. He has um, he said there's no real reason why he shouldn't announce it and he was tempted to, but he wants to prepare people for the actions that will be taken after the sentence is read. I mean, after the judgment is read. Now, and this this is so we don't know. And this is an appeal by his lawyer to try to get uh, the charges against well to get him out of jail earlier earlier, because basically he's serving time as an adult when the crime he admitted to committing and we can talk about that in a minute uh, he was a child at the time. Exactly, and um, the prosecution is saying because he he was sentenced to one global sentence of eight years as uh, part of his plea deal. And the prosecution is arguing that there were, he was sentenced actually to five eight-year sentences that would be served consecutively, which would put him up to a 40-year sentence, mm-hmm. instead of so which would obviously be way over 10 instead of under 10. That 10 years is the cutoff for serving time in a potential jail instead of in a federal um, institution. Well, no. And eight years... Is obviously under um, ten. There's no, you know, it's, it's basic math. Eight years is under ten, so he belongs in a provincial institution. But the federal government is arguing that actually his sentence is five eight-year terms served all at once. And what's really interesting is while I was reading this in the courtroom, his um, Omar's former chief prosecutor, Colonel Morris Davis, who was his prosecutor at Guantanamo until. Colonel Morris Davis resigned because he refused to prosecute a case with evidence that was obtained under torture. But he was Omar's um, first prosecutor, and he was definitely a man who has a deep grudge against Omar. And he was tweeting back at me saying, what are they talking about? Um, we, we sentenced him to eight years, a global sentence, period. We don't do consecutive sentences while this is going on. So it's interesting. Well, so this is a Canadian court's interpretation, or their attempt to uh, interpretate, interpret rather uh, an American military commission sentence, which was part of a plea deal for for uh, for Omar to plead guilty to these five charges, uh, ridiculous charges, really on their face. Can you elucidate, please, uh, uh, Heather, what the five charges uh, Omar uh, uh, copped a plea for? Um, I would. I actually want to go back to this for one second, if you don't mind, the um, the case where they're trying to say that instead of serving one eight-year sentence, he's serving five eight-year sentences layered on top of each other. Right. Because it's actually quite an interesting thing that Canadians ought to know about. Um, because this is a new precedent that is effect- going to affect us all. The judge in his case just, and I'm just looking at the date here of it, um, it was September 11th, the same judge that presided over the hearing today, just in an unprecedented decision, he sentenced um, Travis Baumgartner in Edmonton to life in, in prison with no chance of parole for 40 years on this basically this exact same premise that he was serving consecutive sentences instead. So it's very interesting because his judge is the Associate Chief Justice and he would have appointed himself to preside over Omar's trial. He has He chose his own cases. So it's interesting that he would choose a second case that looks at the exact same question almost, the consecutive versus concurrent argument. And we've never we've never had any such thing. We've never had we've we've never said, Oh, you're serving all these consecutive sentences so the rules don't apply for parole or, or for juvenile sentences or anything like that. In the conversation with Colonel Morris Davis here, um, I say the judge in Carr's case assigned um the case hinges on multiple sentences being consecutive or concurrent. And Colonel Morris Davis says it's clear in his record that it was eight years for all offenses. And I said, I know it's a global sentence. They're debating hypotheticals, which they are. They're they were sitting in court debating if the U.S. had said consecutive or concurrent, which one would they have said? Which is the most ridiculous argument I've ever heard in a court of law. I mean, th- these things didn't happen, so why are we even talking about it? Eight years is less than ten. But, um, like I said, we just had a case on September 11th where this consecutive versus concurrent argument came up just on the 11th with the same justice. So it would be very interesting to read the judgment. It would be very interesting, and all Canadians should be reading the judgment. Well, of course, in the Baumgartner case was the, the security guard who, who killed, uh, what was it, four or yes. five of his colleagues uh, to rip off a bank machine or something. Yes, yes. Um, completely different case, and... The, the judge, 
ruled that he was eligible for parole in, for 40 years just by saying that the charges were consecutive and were served concurrently, not consecutively, right? Well, in, in Omar... And, uh, sorry, go in ahead. In Omar Khayyam's case, well, you would think it would be a, a straightforward case. I mean, eight years is less than ten. And, you know, it was pretty hard to argue, and nobody was arguing it. So you would think that that's absolutely obvious. He should be in a provincial institution. And as his counsel said, nobody brought up this five concurrent sentences argument ever. Nobody has ever mentioned any such thing until Dennis filed for him to be moved to a provincial court, and then suddenly this argument appeared. Um, and, of course, we have Stephen Harper this morning with his, they're going to go all out and... and um, pursue the case as aggressively as they possibly can and everything like that. Well, There's another interesting development this morning, too, as we went in, sorry for interrupting, but I just wanted to let you know, um, there was a big push, as, as there has always been a push for 11 and a half years, for Canadians to never see Omar, and Omar to never see Canadians. And it happened again this morning, Dennis, and he, um, Omar's lawyer has been fighting all along for him to appear in an open court, where he, you know, this is a boy who's been in solitary since he was 15 years old. And he's been away from Canadians and thinking about Canadians for all that time. And Canadians have been thinking about him for all that time. And we've all been wondering, and you know, wondering what is he like? What has, how has he turned out? Is he is he okay? Is he you know violent? Is he what? And um, we've been denied the chance to see him ever. And this is what keeping him in the federal institution is about as well. And um, began this morning. The security tried to keep him in a separate interview room where Dennis could go in and talk to him on occasion, and Dennis fought for him to be brought out for us to see, and for him to see us. And and that didn't happen. It was it was scheduled, but he didn't make his public appearance? He absolutely did. He was <clears> there with us the whole time. And so now can Canadians have seen Omar Cotter, and, and did was, was this televised? I've been at work all day here. Uh, Heather, help me out. Um, oh, yeah, yes, he he came into court, and um, actually, it, it's, it's hard to describe just how emotional the moment was in the court for everybody concerned. It was, I, I wasn't prepared for it at all. I was prepared for the court in a very logical, um, I was looking at this judge and his, you know, consecutive versus concurrent sentencing, and, you know, I knew there were, there were a lot of supporters for Omar in the, in the court, um, we took the biggest court, and they they moved 120 people, and they moved the media into the jury box to make more room, and then squeezed another um, several people in, and then they set up a live stream in the room next to us. So we had 120 in the room I was in, and then there was a live stream in another room that looked pretty tall as well. And um, so there was a lot of people, and everybody that I talked to, most of, about half of them probably were wearing orange or an orange ribbon. And the other half that I talked to were all Omar supporters, too. There was a call that went out on Facebook for people to protest his, um, you know, perhaps being transferred to a provincial institution. But I didn't see anybody there that was not an Omar supporter. But when he walked into the court, I mean, we've all been prepared for Omar. You know, we've all had some vision or other in our minds. And the only two images we have is that sort of broken child image that, you know, that hor the horrible pictures that we've all seen of him with the giant holes blown out of him and buried in the rubble, and, you know, we know he's blind in one eye and the other eye has poor vision, and, you know, we have this horrible little crippled child image, and then we have the images that came out of the Guantanamo approved sketches that we got out of his hearing in Guantanamo, where he's, you know, this sulking um, great thing in orange, right? And those, those are the images everybody has of Omar, and, um, we, and, and there's, you know, accounts from various journalists like David Aiken of Sun Media who has told me frequently that Omar Khadr has massive hands and he looks like he belongs in a football lineup and all this. And Omar came out and he's an absolutely average-sized person. He looks like soccer fit somehow. I have no idea how, but he looks very fit. But, you know, he, there's nothing hulking about him. He's a very average um, person. A lot of people in the court said he was handsome. He's not... He, like, he, he's definitely nice looking, uh, handsome is perfectly fine to use, but the biggest thing is the warmth. Um, when he smiled at his, at especially Nate and Dennis, who are his long-term lawyers, there was just incredible warmth between them, and when he kept looking out at the audience, 120 people who had come there to see him, 
And he'd heard Dennis arguing and fighting with the security guards. Said, the security guards were saying, no, he was to stay in the interview room. And Dennis was saying, no, he's coming out with us. And when he walked out, he honestly, he looked so happy, Chris. It, it's like he was just looking around the room and the whole time thinking. And I kept thinking, you know, this boy has been in, since he was 15, in solitary confinement, thinking about Canadians. And he's looking out to his room where there's 120 Canadians who are looking back at him. And um, he's got this lovely smile. It's so really warm and dimples in the whole bit. So I, I gave him a thumbs up and a peace sign just to get the dimples back because I can't resist dimples. <laughs> and um, But after the court hearing was over, I'm jumping, we, we passed all, all the day at the court hearing, but after the court hearing was over and the judge left the room and Omar was being led away, the court just kind of spontaneously erupted and they all said, Good job, Omar. Stay strong, Omar. And they were all waving at him. It was, it was a very emotional moment. It was like, you know, we've all waited eleven and a half years to see each other, him, us, and us, him. And I had, I really wasn't prepared for just how connected we were to him and how, you know, we've, we've all been listening to this for so many years, this story. And it's, it's like meeting this long lost family member that we've heard so much about. And, you know, whether it's good or bad that you've heard, there's an incredible bond there. And obviously he feels it too because it, it was really obvious from his demeanor. He looked really happy and content to be there. And he told um, people, various people that he communicated with that this is going to be his first appearance in a real court. You know, and he has a, a very idealized vision of Canada. Well, yeah, and we all like to maintain that, <laughs> despite the evidence to the contrary. Yeah, he was in a military a military commission in the States. He copped a plea, and he didn't cop a plea to do five eight-year um, sentences uh, con uh, consecutively. He copped a plea for an eight-year, and he pled guilty to, or pleaded guilty, rather, to these five charges. Now, one of them was the murder of the soldier. Uh, this is, you know, the, the, as the soldiers were, were blowing up this compound, now, he got charged, basically, the way I see it, on the, there was no witnesses, but just because he was the last person, he was the only survivor. Now, what are the other charges, Heather, that he's been charged, that, that uh, he, he pleaded guilty to? Well, there's, um, there's, okay, first of all, there's, there's a, quite a bit, as you know, the Hamden ruling that in the U.S. was, um, he was convicted at Guantanamo, and he's just recently had his, his um, conviction thrown out. He, had, he served it, and he was already home, but he appealed it, and um, his conviction was overturned because these charges cannot be applied retroactively, and they were invented years after Omar was in Guantanamo, after the crimes were committed, and, you know, we all, every international um, human rights issue, you, you can't be tried by retroactive law. You can't make up laws after the fact, and these were created in 2006 and 2008, and for crimes committed in 2002. But murder in violation of the laws of war actually is a crime that exists. But what the U.S. government says he did was certainly not it. And, you know, if it, okay, if, you, if somebody in a war kills somebody else in a war, there is either they're both soldiers, in which case it's not a crime, or one of them is a civilian, in which case it is a crime and it should be tried in a civilian court. And Omar could have been tried in a U.S. or a Canadian or an Afghanistan in court. He had three choices for that one. Or he could have been tried for that one across the military court, not this hopped up military commission thing. And all of the proper channels, there, there were so many channels that he could have been tried in if they had an actual case. And all of them were um, obviously not eligible because they didn't have a proper case. And the, the reason they didn't have a proper case is because he, is, he was not in violation of the laws of war, even if this had happened, and there was plenty of evidence that it didn't happen. And as I said earlier, Colonel Morris Davis resigned as chief prosecutor, even though he has a very deep grudge against Omar and would love to see him put away for life. He resigned because, as a lawyer, he ethically refused to tolerate using evidence obtained under torture. But um, we are, from the U.S. state cables, we actually have the Canadian government saying the U.S. government offered to give them all their evidence if they would prosecute the Omar in a civilian court, and the Canadian government refused because they said he would never be convicted under Canadian law. And that's a quote from the U.S. state cables. 
And so, you know, everybody went over this and found out he would never be convicted, so they had to invent new laws and invent a U.S. military commission bogus court thing and, and invent all these um, completely illegal things, like the, um, the that allowing to torture under, I mean, uh, allowing evidence obtained under torture. And he was, he was not in violation of the laws of war. The point murder in the violation of the laws of war is a legitimate crime, but he was not in violation of the laws of war. He was either a civilian or he was a soldier. You have to pick one and you have to go with the applicable court. You can't just straddle this forever and be a little bit of one and a little bit of the other. And the same as the spying charge, what they, they brought a spying charge against him because they said he was looking at cars on a road. And then, you know, they decided that he was looking at cars on the road just because he wanted to blow them up or something. I guess they were, they were using telepathy to find out what, um, why he was looking at cars on the road. And that's the same thing we saw in court today, where they were using telepathy to find out whether the U.S. sentence would have been consecutive or concurrent if the U.S. did that, which they don't. But um, so the spying charge, we have a kid living in Afghanistan, looking at the road, at the cars on the road in front of where he's living. And that's what they call spying. He's not, he didn't collect any information. He didn't give any information to anybody. There's, you know, I mean, spying is a legitimate crime, but this certainly wasn't it. It doesn't fit the definition in any way. So they had to change the definitions of these crimes. The, the, complete, the, the, the names of the crimes exist, the V aren't them, and there's the definitions that were changed in 2006, 2008, and can't be applied later. Well, whether he was a soldier or a, 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 a civilian or an unlawful combatant or whatever you want to call it, he was a, a child, a child soldier, a child civilian, a child uh, uh, unlawful combatant. But the international covenants protecting child soldiers don't seem to apply in this country. Well, that exactly. If he was a child soldier, we would definitely have that one. And it's just that there's so many Every avenue, there's like, every avenue you want to look at this. One, if you want to look at the evidence, he didn't do it. He didn't kill anybody. He couldn't possibly have. All my own story is that um, he was the first one wounded. He was blinded in the very first, um, when, when they first started shelling, and the people he was with were carrying him from shelter to shelter, and that's why they were all killed, and he wasn't, because at the very end when he was buried in rubble, but be before that, he had been carried from shelter to shelter because he was completely blinded and wounded. He was the first one wounded and the only one that lived. And we've seen the pictures. We know he was shot twice in the back. We know that he was blinded. We know he's buried with the level. And we know we have the U.S. military's report that there was another man that was um, alive and, and shooting at the time. And we have uh, forensic evidence that the shrapnel was... The shrapnel wounds were from a U.S. grenade, which the people in the compound didn't have. In other words, it was from the fire. So we have all the evidence that he didn't actually do it. But if he did do it, then he should have gone to civilian court. And if he didn't want to send him to civilian court, then he was a combatant, then it wasn't a crime, and besides, he should have been treated as a prisoner of war, which means you can't torture him and you can't question him and you can't, you know, name, rank, and serial number, right? Um, there's, there's just every aspect of this case, there's law hedging that, no, you can't do that. How they managed to produce a sentence anyway is, it's remarkable for any of the crimes, right? Well, well, certainly none of the war crimes. They are not, when you see the Canadian media over and over and over say war crimes, these are not war crimes. They are not internationally recognized war crimes, and most importantly, they are not war crimes recognized in Canada. So when you see Canadian media calling these war crimes, we need to ask who are these Canadian media, and why would they call these war crimes, really? Well, it sounds more like projection to me, but uh, Heather, sadly, we're, we're fast out of time. How do people who want to get more information, more than we can possibly go over, because this case is, you know, it's it's huge, how can they get more information? How can they help? Um, there's a, a website, freeomaracotter.com, and we're just about to rip it apart and really revamp it, because we know... Um, Exactly. It's a huge case, and anybody covering it, I think a lot of people, they look at it, and they look for a day or so, and they just, they realize it's way too big, and they can't they can't wrap their heads around it all, um, you know, 11 and a half years of legal decisions. So we're going to make the, the website far more of a resource. It already is a great resource, but um, we're going to put in much more of a timeline and a reference so that people can actually look up 
what exactly happened, what's the applicable law, and journalists can have an easier time writing about it. Okay. And it's free Omar Akbar. But one of the biggest things is his lawyer, Dennis Edney, has been fighting for him, for, for Omar Carter, for all these years, pro bono, and he's used all his money um, hiring witnesses and traveling to Guantanamo. And really, Dennis Edney is fighting for all of our rights. This Omar is our canary in a coal mine. These are our the rights of all Canadians that are being completely thrown out here. Okay. And in my opinion, all Canadians should support him. And okay. that's on the site as well. Okay, okay, Heather. Well, thanks a lot. We're fast. We're right out of time, actually. But thanks a lot for your work. Sorry. Thanks for coming on. And I also want to thank uh, uh, Jay Hartling. Remember, this Friday, 7 p.m. down at the uh, Cafe Simpatico, 1923 Fernwood. Thanks to Janine and all the people who keep things going. Stay tuned. Arnold's coming straight up. I, I can see his fingerprints on the door. He's coming in with uh, rhythm ning to jazz you into this uh, rather nice uh, evening here, uh, the first day of autumn. Until the next time.